And we're at verse 17. So the context is speaking about Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, he came to preach peace to them. Let's read that text. And came, so Jesus came and preached peace. So Jesus was preaching peace to you, which were afar off. To you people who were far away from God. Now, the you that Paul was referring to is that he's speaking to Gentiles here. Remember, that was the context from Ephesians 2 that we were reading, Jews and Gentiles. So you which were afar off is referring to Gentiles. Gentiles were very far away from God. And to them that were nigh, that's referring to the Jews. The Jews are always those that were always close to God. They were God's people. So Jesus Christ preached peace to both sides of the people. He both Jews and Gentiles peace. Now that's really important over there. So then this peace, what is the context? Well, when you look at the entirety of Ephesians chapter 2, the context over here is referring to salvation. It's referring to the gospel. So we're going to look at a few examples. Let's first of all start off with Romans chapter 10 to show that the peace that Jesus preached to is actually the gospel. Let's look at Romans chapter 10. So the peace is referring to the gospel. That Christ died, buried, and resurrected. Romans chapter 10. And then we'll read what the Bible uh, explains <coughs> at verse 14. Uh, verse 15, actually. We'll start with verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So notice over here that uh, if you look at 14 and 15, it's referring to the context of people who are far away. People who are far away, they are ministered with the gospel of peace. So that fits appropriately with Ephesians chapter 2 then. The context matches over here. Scripture with scripture matches. So the gospel of peace, Paul's gospel, why is it known as peace? Because it's bringing glad tidings of good things. Now some people fail to understand this. But the gospel means good news. Amen. So that's why it obviously means peace over here. <coughs> so it makes you wonder when you're street preaching, when you're soul winning, you got to realize this. True, we can't compromise. We have to mention about sin and hell. Jesus is the only way. But you've got to understand this. The only reason why we say those negative things is to make them see how much it is good news that Jesus died to save you from all of that. It doesn't become really good news or relief to the people if they don't realize their problems to begin with, their conditions to begin with. So usually, let's say a person is dying of cancer and then you mention to the person that, hey, we have a cure for your cancer, then the person will take it as really great news, right? But if a person never had cancer and you said, hey, here's a medicine that would cure your cancer, then the person would naturally be offended, right? Are you telling me I got cancer? See, so that's why preaching about sin, hell, and Jesus is the only way to heaven is important. However, you can't just keep pr uh, preaching about cancer, cancer, cancer to the point where the person does not see it as good news. So that will help you with your balance. So you've got to think when you're preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is very important, you're given a task, friend. When you're given the task of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you seriously have to ask yourself, am I preaching good news to the people or am I preaching hate? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Now, look, if the world accuses you of hate when you're actually preaching the good news to them, then who cares what people think? The devil distorted their mind. But do they have legitimacy when they say you're preaching hate? That's what you have to question and ask yourself. So you're preaching to people who are far off. 
And that's why these people all the way from hundreds and hundreds of miles and miles away, they can receive the gospel. And that's good news that they get saved from hell. Amen. What better news can it be than that? So here are people who are hundreds of miles away, if not thousands of miles away, and then they can receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, this is then very important. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. If these people are being preached peace, <clears throat> and the context over here is referring to the gospel, wait a minute then. Who's the one that's preaching at Ephesians 2? It, remember, it was referring to Jesus, right? And came and preached peace to them that are far off. Wait a minute, then that means then Paul was not the first one to preach that gospel. Now that's very important to understand. There's a heretical group, a cultish group called hyper-dispensationalists. These people are also known as the Mid-Acts Church. So they call themselves Grace Churches. So these people, they claim that since Paul was the first one to preach the gospel, that when you look at great verses like John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know that famous verse? They'll say that, oh no, that's not applied to, that's not for the people when you're preaching the gospel right now. You shouldn't preach to them that. That's for Jews. How dare you? That's a wonderful promise. Amen. That's a wonderful verse. How dare would you get rid of a beautiful verse like that and say, no, that's not for us today. John chapter 3, verse 3 is another example. Don't we preach out of this today? Yep. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So then hyper-dispensationalists, mid-acts, they hyper-divide by saying, this born again is not for you, this is another born again for the nation of Israel. So they divide this new birth. You see, that's hyper-dividing. So people like that, you should beware. You should beware, not think that, oh, these are okay people. No, when you overtly divide things, then you have a tendency to divide more and steal promises that Christians can claim for themselves and have a blessing from. You steal blessings and promises away from God's people, and the person whose job is to steal every blessing and promise from a believer, because you got it rather than he does, is the devil. The devil would want you to be robbed of the blessings and promises because he was, he doesn't have any of them. All right. So John chapter 3, verse 16, you'll notice that Jesus Christ preached about his death. And then he says, if you believe and trust in it, then you have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 3, which we just read, you get born again. Uh, he also mentions again, verse 7, Marvel not that I say it unto thee, you must be born again. Jesus says, <clears throat> don't be surprised if I tell you you have to be born again. That means it's very important to Jesus. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we are a dispensational church. So what do we believe in? As Bible-believing dispensationalists, we believe that until the timeline of the Apostle Paul, before then, before that timeline, the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching, that's when the gospel became clear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Before the Apostle Paul, it wasn't that clear. That's why uh, there were apostles who debated about the Jewish law at Acts 15, because it wasn't clear that time. So we agree that the gospel about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ wasn't made clear until the Apostle Paul. But we deny the teaching that there, were, there weren't glimpses or hints of it before the Apostle Paul. Jesus was preaching and giving hints and glimpses. As a matter of fact, you can even find them in the Old Testament. Glimpses of salvation by grace, not by works. There are plenty of glimpses of that. But you see, God did not make it clear. He only gave hints of that during the Old Testament. 
And then he was building it up, building it up, and then finally he made it full, complete, and official through the Apostle Paul. All right, now let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. So that's where we distinguish from hyper-dispensationalists. They think that it starts from Paul, it began with Paul, there was no even a hint or a glimpse before Paul. Then why was Paul quoting Old Testament verses? For his salvation by grace, not by works argument. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and then we'll read verse 18. For through him, so through Jesus Christ, we both, okay, who's we both? That's referring again to Jews and Gentiles. Now, I want people to understand this, is that the reason why I'm, uh, I want you to pay attention to each and every word. So I want you to pay attention to each and every word in that verse and try to understand every word. So like That way it won't feel dull to you. The reason why it's feeling dull is be because probably you're not thinking that about, I got to understand each and every word what the teacher's trying to explain here. If you do that, then it'll help you with your attention span better. Now, the Jews and Gentiles, that's we both Paul is referring to. Because remember the context of Ephesians 2. So Jews and Gentiles both have access by one spirit. So they both have access through the Holy Spirit. Through that Holy Spirit, they were able to make both, uh, the Holy Spirit was able to make both parties one unto the Father. So if it wasn't for that Holy Spirit who came down and united Jews and Gentiles, then they would not have been able to reach the Father up in heaven. So, go to Acts chapter 2, and then I want you to also go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Acts 2. Now, the mid-Acts group, the hyper-dispensationalists, again, they have a problem here. The problem is they put everything at the Apostle Paul, all right? Everything starts with the Apostle Paul. Everything starts with the Apostle Paul. Nothing goes before the Apostle Paul. So here's one of the examples. They think that the body of Christ, the body of Christ that the Apostle Paul preached did not begin, on, uh, did not begin when Jesus died. It did not begin at the beginning of Acts. It happened all the way at the middle of Acts or at the way end of Acts, Acts 28, or some of them go to the extreme of to the book of Ephesians. So there was no body of Christ long before Ephesians or the, or the middle, middle of Acts. So that's uh, hyper-dispensational. The reason why is because of Paul, see? They want to put all at Paul when Paul began teaching it. But no, the body of Christ, it began at the cross, and the evidence for that is this. The evidence is, as we have looked at verse 16, he reckons, as I told you before, the both parties, Jews and Gentiles, became one body of Jesus Christ by the cross. And how we know that it started at Acts 2 is because it says, in context, the cross is the one that started the body of Christ, but then it operated when you notice at verse 18. It had the Holy Spirit. So when did the Holy Spirit come down? When did he come down? It was Acts 2. See? So go to Acts chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty, mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. See that? So they, that's when the Holy Spirit come, came down. And notice verse 47, it says church. That's when the church started. That's what we believe. That's when the church or the body of Christ, it started at Acts chapter 2. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came down. Even Paul says so at 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. 
The problem with mid-Acts people and hyper-dispensationalists is that they treat Paul like their idol, like their God, even though they don't mean to. Like he is their magic cookie or something. We get 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You got to realize Paul is not the final authority. It is God, the word of God itself. So when the word of God says otherwise, then you got to go by the word of God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by what one spirit are we all baptized? Ah, when did that start? Acts 2, right? Remember? Into what? One body. See, you become the body of Christ, whether we be what? Jews or Gentiles. See, that follows with Ephesians 2. 